today on the lowdown, a Down syndrome podcast. And Jolie gives us the lowdown on Down syndrome and sexuality. Over to you, Marla and Hannah. Thank you, Danielle. It's Marla here, SLP and co-host of the Lowdown podcast. With me in studio is Hina Mahmoud, fabulous co-host and lead OT at the DSRF. Before we get into today's topic, I just want to pause for a second and remark about how wonderful it is to collaborate with Hina and bring this information to you. We really enjoy it and we owe so much to the lovely guests who have dedicated their time and energy to talking with us. Of course, behind the scenes is Glenn, communications master of the DSRF, and he is the glue that holds our podcast together. Today, we will be focusing on a topic that is hugely relevant for adolescents and adults with Down syndrome, and that is sexuality much how expectations around independence, literacy, and employment, and even social inclusion have changed over the years, so have the realizations around sexuality in this group. We realize that this topic might make some people squirm, and in part that's why we're doing it. We're hoping to equip you with some tools, conversational or otherwise, so that this topic doesn't have to be so awkward. So today we have a wonderfully talented guide for this conversation, um, our awesome teacher at the DSRF, Andrea Lee. Andrea received her master's in education in Montessori methodology and children with exceptionalities at Loyola University in Maryland in the US. Previously, she graduated from the University of British Columbia with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology and Classical Literature. Andrea is a BC certified teacher who currently runs programs for young adults at the DSRF, as well as one-to-one literacy and math. Initially inspired by the young adults in her group programs and seeing a need for the whole Down syndrome community, Andrea has recently graduated from Options Sexual Health Educator Certification Program, the only one of its kind in Canada. It's pretty great. She is currently completing her practicum at the DSRF, developing group and one-to-one programs for all ages. She is excited to offer comprehensive sexual health education and guidance for folks with Down syndrome in establishing fun, healthy, and safe relationships with themselves, their bodies, and others. Andrea, welcome to the Lowdown Podcast. Yay, thanks. We're so happy to have you. I'm so excited to do this and very nervous. And no, don't but be nervous. We're all, we, we, well, we know each other, so this is great. <laughs> I know, and I'm so excited for this topic to be included because... I haven't really heard much about this topic in any other podcast about Down syndrome, so we're very excited to have you with us. Mm -hmm. Um, We have a tradition here at The Lowdown where before we start getting into the topic, we ask our guests five secret questions to get for our audience to get to know them a little bit better. This is what I'm the most nervous about. Oh, no, no. (laughs) It's okay. Uh, Everyone that has said that they've been nervous in the past have actually really loved the question, so so we have a good track record going so far. All right, are you ready? Yes. Okay, so question number one. Andrea, what is your favorite thing to do by yourself? Um, sleep oh, mm. or read. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, this works perfectly into our next question. What are you currently reading right now? Uh, right now, I'm listening to an audio book called Hunger by Roxane Gay. It's a memoir of what happened to her after her sexual assault mm. and I'm also on a lighter note I'm also trying to make my way through the Eternals comic book series oh. because they're making another Marvel movie yes yes you gotta read the book before you watch the movie yeah. so yeah. I got a lot of issues to go through <laughs> so. and I know Andrew and I sometimes will chat about superhero movies at work She's the one that made me watch all the Avengers, and I thank her for that. Because I've got really to educate fun. people in more ways than yes, just literally. Yes, you do exactly. <laughs> and yes, you're expanding my cultural. Uh, yeah, pop yeah, culture exactly. is very view. important. <laughs> yeah, and it is great because so many of our students love um, superheroes too. So it's kind of work related as well. It is. It yeah, is. Prepares you really well. Exactly. Yeah. For sure. I need a lot of classes, Andrea. Help me, yeah. please. Oh, we'll do it. One-to-one tutoring. <laughs> yes, <laughs> one-to-one tutoring on superhero movies. Yes. Comics 101. Uh-huh. Um, okay, question number three. So you and I. I share an affinity for the reality show Survivor. We talk about that all the time. What are your top three material possessions you would take to a deserted island? Oh my god. Or goodness. if you were going on an episode of Survivor or a season. That's amazing. What would I take? <laughs> um, and I'm assuming there's nothing there? Nothing there. Just three bring, like, material own... possessions you need to have with you. Okay, so I bring something to make fire because I don't think I would be able to do it otherwise. Okay. I would bring like a bed (laughs) 
or something that separates me from the cold ground. Because、mm, if you're、yeah. not rested, okay, you're, you're you can't do anything、yeah. during the rest of the day. Uh huh. And oh, I don't know. I've had a really、something、fun. fun. Fun summer paddleboarding, so、oh, let's bring that along.、Excellent. I could use it for fishing, and it'd be really fun. <laughs> Spoken like a true Survivor fan. <laughs> you're, like, you're thinking in Survivor contestant mode too, like, like all like pictures of my、needs. family. No, no. <laughs> toothbrush. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic! I love it. I was very excited to ask you that question. So I'm glad that you got, that you enjoyed it as well.、That. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got two more to go. So question number four: If you could only eat one item of food for the rest of your life, what would you eat?、Uh, Doesn't have to be an ingredient. It could be a dish, but however you want. So、answer. if I was like sushi, it could be many types of sushi. Sure, you can group it all. So sushi for the rest of your life. <sighs> But what about pasta and pizza and sandwiches <laughs> That's and potatoes? Yeah, I know. <laughs> Pot- no, potatoes for the rest of your life. No way. <laughs>、yeah. No, let's go with sushi. Okay. Because a, choice,、yeah. you know, culturally、yeah. significant for me,、yeah. and you could <laughs> throw protein and veg and fruits in there. Yeah. So、mm-hmm. I wouldn't, you、a、know, pasta version maybe. get、It's、scurvy、like、or something. <laughs> <laughs> scurvy. <laughs> I just really don't want to get scurvy from my new diet of one food for the rest of my life. Okay. Such, I, such think, I think it's thinking, I, I think it's versatile. Yeah, yeah, and it's fresh. Like yeah, easy to exactly. make. Only got pasta. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh. After but, day three, you'd be done. Yeah, yeah. but I'd be pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a happy done. <laughs> I'd gain ninety pounds of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our last question: If you could be any animal, what would you、Whoa. be? I don't know why this question. I'm like, wow, this is the hardest question I've ever been asked. <laughs>、um, maybe a bird because I always think flying would be cool. Okay. And my favorite bird is a barn owl, but I don't know if that's the best bird to be. <laughs> owls are pretty great. They are pretty great,、yeah. and barn owls are so cute. Yeah, and you can,、are. you know, live with other animals in barns and still see people sometimes because I like people. Yeah. And I wouldn't、Your、have to. Nighttime is party time. Nighttime's party time, which、yeah. is cool. Yeah,、I'll、got that、it. cute little round face. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go、okay. barn owl.、Uh, barn owl,、oh. great choice. I love it. Okay, I'm already well, regretting you. this. <laughs> You're already rethinking the、I'm、answers deep, for a lot of them. <laughs> deep sea creature. Yeah,、exactly. I've never seen that. I never will. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for indulging in that. That was really、yeah. fun. Actually, I, even I learned some fun things about you too. So that、oh、was great. Oh my gosh, me too. Expect a barn owl themed birthday card. Exactly. Coming your way. Yeah. Oh、Something、yeah. Something barn owl themed coming your March way. March twenty second. Everybody do it. <laughs> barn owls for all. We should all just dress up as barn owls. What? And we would do that at the DS or if we're very creative and、oh、my willing to go out of our comfort zone. But、way. now you're setting me up for disappointment when no one、I、gives、know. me a barn owl for my birthday. All my coworkers that are probably listening to this are like, Hannah, no. <laughs> like, don't like don't promise.、Theme. Don't think this is really weird. <laughs> well, thank you for doing that. That was really fun. So let's kind of get into our topic for the day.、Um, before we kind of deep deep dive into it, I wanted to know how you became interested in the area of sexual health for people with、um, Down syndrome and developmental disabilities overall. I'll start with how I got interested in sexual health, just in general.、Mm-hmm. I feel like comprehensive sexual health. Is hugely misunderstood, and people just focus on the sex in sexual health, and they're like, "Gross," or whatever. It's a very North American thing to feel a lot of shame, a lot of taboo, a lot of discomfort around anything at all related to sex. And then you throw in children, you throw in people with disabilities,、mm-hmm. you throw in a lot of things. People are like, "Nah, that's okay." Maybe just won't talk about it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I used to work before working here. I worked at a few small private schools, and even though sexual health is on the curriculum, they were like, "Well, there's a lot of things that are more important, so we just won't do it." Or they made it optional. And then once it was optional, I remember one year only four families opted into it,、mm-hmm. and I was like, "This is way more important than you are realizing."、Mm-hmm. And so I just really want to emphasize that comprehensive sexual health is. Yes, you talk about sex and STIs and reproduction, and all the safety around、mm-hmm. pr- abuse prevention around it. But there's just way more that goes into it too.、Yeah. There's, you know, your understanding your assigned sex at birth and what that means for your body and body changes. There's your gender and your gender identity. There's Sensuality and intimacy, and how do you fulfill your need for touch and things、mm-hmm. like that in a expected and appropriate way? There's 
decision making, there's pleasure, uh, family rela relationships, friendships, mm -hmm. problem solving, dating, your personal boundaries. Are you ever going to be a parent? What am I doing in this culture? You know, what is my culture saying and how can I interpret it to fit for me? There's a lot of things in the media with your religion, with your family, social media, TV movies that you're bombarded with, mm -hmm. how you're supposed to act, how you're supposed to look, what you're supposed to do, who you're supposed to have relationships with, what your body's supposed to look like. Yeah. And it's a lot for anybody to take and you're just gonna leave a child to manage that on their own. You're just gonna leave somebody with an intellectual disability to muck through that all on their own mm -hmm. when they're feeling all of these things that people are just like, no, no, there's more important things to deal with. I mean, there are things that you should be dealing with first, but it's just to have the confidence in yourself as a person who can have relationships in this world and feel good about themselves, you need to have comprehensive sexual mm -hmm. education to help navigate that for you mm -hmm. because it's complex world out there. Yeah, yeah. even and, some of the items that you listed, I was like, oh yeah, that's true. There's, it is such a wide, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a huge range. Mm -hmm. A huge range, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think you're right. It, the focus is usually really, really narrow mm -hmm. and only on the taboo, more taboo areas of it that yeah, people yeah. don't want to talk about at all. And so then other things really get missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they think it's just put a condom on this banana or yeah. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. But there's way more skills like, you know, hygiene and grooming mm -hmm. and like a lot of things that you're doing with OT, mm -hmm. uh, your body parts and what their functions are and what's this fluid that I've never seen before mm -hmm. and how come this started in this, you know, yeah. like your body could be really gross if you don't understand it when it's really, really wonderful when you do understand it, mm -hmm. like emotions around all of these things, like there's so much. Thing. There's so many things you can question when it, within yourself because of all the message you're getting from a heteronormative society, from a, you know, ableist society, that people need help, yeah. like expressing why they're not feeling good about themselves or mm -hmm. why they don't think they're going to get a romantic partner, why they can't do this and that for so many things like how like why they can't be assertive and set their own boundaries and decide for themselves this was too much this was not enough mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. and i think from the social perspective i mean often when in the SL par slp department we work with teenagers it is often around social skills and more particularly around crushes versus yeah. friendships mm -hmm. and looking at it from a little bit of a different lens and a sexual health lens that might be the perfect starting place to really understand mm -hmm. yourself well before you go and try and start these relationships with other people mm -hmm, yeah. definitely mm -hmm. there's so much of that involved in this and that's mm -hmm. why it's so nice to be here we can all work together Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna conquer the world <laughs> yes. on sexual health on sexual health conquering yes exactly and i just think it's just so empowering yeah mm -hmm. for and any you person up, um you were we mentioned that you know it is challenging for someone with an intellectual disability to kind of figure it out on their own and they are very curious mm -hmm. they're seeing it in their families you know they're they're um you know, like if, if a teenager getting a teenage girl ready to for her first period, like those kind of things. So they they it's there's things that are inevitably inevitably going to happen, but like how do we prepare them best for it so exactly. that it's not a scary or a traumatizing experience, but it is something that they're going in there knowing full well what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's it's also kind of nice because everybody's going to go through it too, mm -hmm. and it's just like you know, and also somebody with Down syndrome even if their intellectual age or their cognitive understanding might be a bit behind their peers, mm -hmm. they're probably going to go through a lot of these hormonal changes around the same time. So the crushes will happen yeah. around the same time, mm -hmm. puberty, periods, yeah. mm -hmm. everything else is going to happen around the same time. Mm -hmm. And it's confusing for all these teens and preteens mm -hmm. and they can go through that together, yeah. you know, this yeah, exactly. never ending crush on every single person yeah. that is yeah. nice to you. <laughs> Crushes are such a tricky it's thing to really navigate, for sure. Um, so let's start at the beginning. So many people assume that people with Down syndrome either are not or cannot be sexually active. Um, this isn't the case. So can you give us the facts? What are your thoughts on this? Oh, such a, okay. <laughs> such a big question. Like, yeah, there's a ton of myths about 
people with Down syndrome, they're very infantilized. Mm -hmm. It's just like, no, they have no interest in romantic relationships and sexual activity. And just with anybody, a lot of people don't. There's, you know, a lot of people are asexual, aromantic, and they're not going to have this interest in it. But you still have to acknowledge that because then that still goes against everything society tells you, like you're supposed to. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, isn't this your boyfriend? Isn't that your, aren't you going to have kids? Even if you don't mean it, that's just the running joke that everybody has. So I feel like we still need to acknowledge that. And, you know, just because, you know, their favorite music group might be the Wiggles, Mm -hmm. I'm like thinking of people in my class, (laughs) they still have the same desires and wants and needs for themselves and their relationships, whether that's romantic or sexual. Mm -hmm. And then you were saying like, oh, are they sexually active? And I feel like we need to (laughs) define like what that even means, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, If we're just talking about experiencing pleasure within their own bodies, you know, whether that's themselves touching their genitals or whether that's with a partner of some sort, Mm -hmm. you know, romantic or friend or whatever is going to happen, then yeah, of course they're going to be sexually active if it's talking about like well are they going to be having kids and reproducing and things like that well then that's a much trickier question that i Mm -hmm. think we're going to talk about more later Mm -hmm. but definitely there's going to be exploration of their own bodies there's going to be exploration with other people's bodies and if you want to do it in a safe way in a Mm -hmm. consensual way in a way that it's pleasurable for everybody then we got to acknowledge this like a lot of them will like I feel like there were a lot of studies done uh, like in the 80s and the 90s that a lot of people are still going off of when people were institutionalized with Down syndrome, when they had so little limited social interaction Mm -hmm. with with no control, where of course they're not romantically interested in anyone because they've only ever seen, you know, a bunch of nurses and their family. Mm But now, like you were talking in the introduction, now that everybody, the expectation for inclusion is so much more wonderful and they're on sports teams and they're in their class and they're mm-hmm. doing all of these things, then yeah, you are seeing this like budding like sexual s- interest in people because they're meeting more people. They're meeting more like-minded individuals too. Yeah. People that they have you know, an equal relationship with where it doesn't feel like, oh, this person's just, taking care of me it's like Mm -hmm. I have peers now and I'm kind of interested in them and what does that mean and Mm -hmm. what am I going to do about it and what do people do yeah I want to come back to one of the things that you Mm -hmm. said a little bit earlier which was the sort of immature interest compared to somebody's physical development and hormones and puberty and I think the point you made was extremely important that you cannot take somebody's interests and use that as a marker for what's going on in their mind in terms of what they want their from bodies, friends yeah. mm-hmm. or relationships or even what they're experiencing in their own body. So, you know, liking My Little Pony or whatever doesn't yeah. mean that you don't have 15 year old level desires. Yeah. yeah. Or, or, you know, restricting kids to just in those interests in hopes that they won't yeah start to shift their focus towards you know towards sex and the feelings that you have it's not going to happen because so much of it is controlled by the physiology of our body and the right. hormones that you can't really control from an external environment so right you you're not going to prevent it you're not going to prevent it exactly yeah. Yeah. and even in all media even for children there's a lot of like they still have crushes on each other and they're mm-hmm. still romantically involved and there's a king and a queen and yeah. you know hints of marriage even if they're not talking about what they're doing within that marriage yeah. but the, you know and even then you can build this fantasy life that you don't fully understand with your own desires that you're having for somebody else mm-hmm. but it's never been explained to you because of people other didn't pe- expect you could do it exactly yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. you know sometimes we notice that there are issues around which activities should be public and which should be private because you were talking a little bit earlier about you know pleasure and you know exploring your body and all those kind of things and there are situations that I've come across and we've all come across where some of our kiddos parents are talking to us about like oh you know he's touching himself and 
I don't want him to do it or I want him to do it in this environment versus this environment. Do you have any tips, you know, for how to make this conversation more successful or concrete for our individuals with Down syndrome? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> Great. Oh, also, look, I missed a whole page of stuff I wanted to talk about for the last question. Okay. Oh, well, well, we can go back. We can always go back. Well, okay. Don't worry about the time. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do this now, and if that comes up, I might like force it in, sure. and if not, yeah. we can go back. Because okay. I was like, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. <clears throat> yeah, oh my goodness, privacy is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And it comes up a lot for everybody. So, neurotypical people, the general population, whatever you want to call it, we were just talking about it this morning. You see a lot of naked kids, a lot of naked toddlers, a lot of naked yep. babies. There's no modesty at all. Nope. There's no sense of privacy. And quite often it's because that, that time in your life you're under surveillance. You can't do these things on your own. So a lot of people are seeing you naked. You're leaving the door open when you go to the washroom because <laughs> so many things can go wrong. You don't know how to dress yourself. You're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> uncle this, auntie that, please help me. You know, you just need a lot of help. And then you don't care. And then what happens, you know, usually when you're preschool age, school age, for a lot of the typical population, you kind of naturally pick up on all of these social cues and societal mm -hmm. norms. And you realize, ooh, I can't do this all the time. I don't want everybody to see this. You know, my daughter has been going through this where some people, are, <laughs> she'd just be like, take off her dress. Now she's like, oh, no. Can you leave the room? And I'll be like, no, you should go somewhere private. You know, don't make yeah. everybody else go around you. But she's picking up on that now when I didn't have to explicitly say that to her. So when you look at our folks with Down syndrome, their, go their lives are going to be monitored and facilitated and helped for much longer than everybody else. You know, like, of course, Hina, you would know you're doing toileting, yeah. dressing, grooming for a long time. They're going to need people in the washroom with them, helping them in the change room and locker rooms helping them out and it's a whole bunch of different people too there's so many complex medical issues where there's a lot of people a lot of specialists they're going to see that are touching them and maybe not asking for permission and so if you've lived your entire childhood everybody's seeing your body nobody really explaining explicitly why everybody's seeing your body and it's for you know, legitimate reasons, legitimate reasons yeah. for your safety and your health, it's going to be a lot harder to come across that modesty and that idea of my body is mine and it's private when it's being shared with everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to come a lot later and you're going to have a lot um, fewer moments where you get to express that privacy for yourself. Even if you want to close your door and just do something on your own, your family, your people at school, whoever might be like, oh, 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 but you might need help to leave the door open so I know yeah. when I can help you. And that's legitimate too, mm -hmm. yeah, but sure. it just makes the idea of privacy so, 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 so much harder. And mm -hmm. that's why we have to have altered scripts around it for people with Down syndrome. It's gonna be much different than mm -hmm. how you came across yeah. privacy in yourself. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's a bunch of areas where you have to you know, address privacy it's going to be very hard to generalize it. Mm -hmm. So first is your body. You know, everybody talks about private parts, but for our folks with Down syndrome who are visual learners, you might need a visual for that. You might yeah. need to draw it. Like a lot of people will say, oh, it's whatever's under your underwear, right? Mm -hmm. But then you come across some of our teens who are developing and they don't wear a bra for mm -hmm. sensory reasons. Mm -hmm. So then they're like, well, if I'm not wearing a bra, it's not a private part, it's not underwear my underwear. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people will say the bathing suit zone, but does that mean your back and your belly button's a private part? Yeah. It gets a little messy. You might have to actually draw it out and be like nipples, Explicit. vulva, anus, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah. Oh, I, I'll get yeah. to this a lot of the times and please use the actual words, words for body the body parts. parts. It's mm -hmm. so, 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 so important. Yeah. If I don't get to that in more detail, yeah. <laughs> remind me and <Okay>. I will. <laughs> so yeah, you have to understand that your body is your own. 
you're in control of it. You wouldn't ask your doctor or your mom or your dad or your guardian when you're itchy to scratch an itch. You shouldn't have to ask them for any permission to touch, to look at, to explore your body. Mm -hmm. But you can't do that everywhere and anywhere in any given yeah. situation. Oh. And I think that's a, such a good point you bring up too because the thing is the, the private thing doesn't mean that it's a bad thing that you're doing. Yeah. It's just that there's certain places that you should do it. Exactly. You know, because I think sometimes parents will parents or educators will kind of put the point across that it's actually private because you shouldn't be doing it. And it's yes. a clear cut thing that you yes. do explain to our kids yeah and that's a lot of things that are tricky with when you're talking about this too a lot of people will talk about private acts private parts or mm -hmm. they won't talk about it at all mm -hmm. and the message that you're sending with your silence is that it's bad yeah you know you might have you know if you're exploring your body you're like ah oh, that felt really good or that was cool or that was interesting or i don't understand this but you, if people never ever ever talk about it you're like oh yeah Am I bad that I discovered that within myself, that I saw that within myself? I should not do it. But then, and every time you do it, you you can create a lot of shame around somebody. For sure. And if people aren't talking about that with, it, they may, it's more uncomfortable, for sure, talking about it with somebody with a disability, quite often because you have to say it more explicitly than you would. And maybe more times. And yeah. A, yeah. so many more times until it sticks. You know, the reminder, like, oh, let's keep your pants on and your underwear on because yep. whatever. And it feels like you're saying it over and over time. It's how many times can I say penis? How many times can I yeah. ask you not to show your butt? Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> hundreds, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, it might have to get to that point. And so, like, you know, yeah. a lot of it's going to be talking about your body. And then, like we said, the next thing you have to talk about for public and private is spaces. Mm -hmm. What's a public space? What's a private space? You know, your home, is that a private space? No, there's public areas in your home. Your family, your family's friends, whoever's in your house doesn't want you strutting around naked down the hall at the dinner table. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. every family's different, so maybe. And if you're consistent, you know, you're gonna have your own rules. But then you have to come up with that. This is a public space in our home. The expectation is that's going to be different for every family. You're wearing a bathrobe. You've got at least a towel on. You are fully dressed. I don't know. That's something you have to be consistent with. Yeah, and very, you know? very clear. And very, yeah. very clear. Mm -hmm. It can be like your private space is your washroom or this washroom when the door is closed. It is your bedroom when the door is closed. If you have a shared bedroom, maybe the rules are different. Yeah. But you have to be really consistent. Have the whole family modeling it so that everybody does have a private space because you should be allowed to do yeah. this and if you don't have a private space you're going to do it anywhere yeah. everywhere yeah. some are very dangerous you know for you if you're caught doing it some are really unexpected and uncomfortable for everybody else mm -hmm. and then when you're looking at public spaces identifying a private space and a public space you know a washroom a locker room mm -hmm. What are the expectations there? What can I do in a change room? How much clothes can I keep on? What can I touch? What's the expected behaviors in this public or private space? Yeah. So really, you know, if you're teaching somebody a bathroom is a private space, you do what you want there. But that's not true for all bathrooms, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You can't just bathe and shower or touch yourself in every single bathroom if it's yeah. at McDonald's or <laughs> whatever. You know, you're exactly. going to have to be very explicit in your teaching yeah. of these spaces. Yeah. Then topics of conversation. Oh my goodness, I'm sure Marla, <laughs> this must come up all the time. It's oh, like, oh, does oh, it ever. <laughs> maybe you shouldn't tell your mom's medical issues to your friends. Oh, uh -huh. You know, maybe you shouldn't talk about your period to your basketball coach. <laughs> maybe uh -huh. you, yeah. you know, and That's so once you're one. understanding your body spaces, now you got to talk about conversations. Now you have to talk about relationships that you have with people and who can have a private conversation and who can't. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a private topic. You can talk about it with mom and dad, your doctor. I don't know. It would be up to your family to decide who mm -hmm. else is in on that. Your older yeah. sister, brother. But you not can't, your... <laughs> exactly. You yeah. can't talk about it with Hina <laughs> or yeah. whatever. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's so many things that can come up. Yeah. That it's just, you know, if someone's talking 
on the bus about oh my goodness mm -hmm. my body's changing you can attract a lot of yeah terrible attention or mm -hmm. unsafe attention mm -hmm. and we know that it happens all the time but it's just something that yeah. repeatedly as all these teachable moments come up hopefully before these things come up yeah. you know and I think so many of these things I think our listeners are like thinking oh I never would have even thought about this aspect of it or mm -hmm. this aspect of it so it kind of goes back to what wide range there is in this topic and yeah and like private and public isn't just touching yourself but there's yeah the conversation part I think it's a really good point that you can't have certain conversations in public with people you don't know versus and which is kind of hard because also <laughs> all of this I'm not even done I got a whole nother <laughs> topic <laughs> yeah. where it's like this is never ending this is so much where do yeah. I even start and yeah. it is a lot Mm -hmm. And it kind of sucks that you have to do so much more explicit teaching mm -hmm. than anybody else. And I acknowledge that it's going to be really hard and mm -hmm. that you're going to forget a lot. And it's going to be a team effort with your SLP, with yeah. your OT, you know, yeah. when you're covering hygiene and grooming and all that stuff, with people like me who this is our specialty, mm -hmm. yeah. with a lot of books and things like that. Like we can give you the actual altered script that you will use with your child. Yeah little phrases here and there because it's going to be really hard and you're, yeah. you are going to miss stuff and it hopefully like <laughs> hopefully it won't be the end of the world there are many 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 things to yeah. do yeah mm -hmm. oh and so my last one is behavior so that's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. types of touch with yourself and with others there are private touches there are public touches you know you have your first romantic partner and you're so excited and you're making out in the middle of class and whoa unexpected <laughs> yeah. Yeah. let's do that in, in a private area yeah. or in a less public area and there's a lot of nuance and there is and yeah. you know when you think of a lot of media stuff it's not modeled very yeah. well yeah exactly right like, yeah. what you know, how is many high going on have kids kissing in the back row or yes. whatever yes yeah. and music videos and, and all this touching and then you get in trouble for doing it in your class exactly what the heck. Yeah. yeah yeah that's a very good point and it's really sad too because a lot of people will do this you know in a park and if you're a couple with down syndrome and you do this people are going to be visibly more uncomfortable with you doing that when you should be able to cuddle you a little and to, yeah. hold mm -hmm. hands and kiss mm -hmm. I think the other yeah. thing is too, though, typically developing people are maybe sneakier. Yes, yeah. And, you know, so they can get away with things more, mm -hmm. whereas our students do the same things, they just get caught. Exactly. And, but also there's people watching them almost yeah. all yeah. the time. Yeah, that's a really good point, yeah, because yeah. they, they get caught even though... They're not doing anything different. They're not doing anything different, right? Like, it's almost like, yeah, exactly. It's almost like the target is bigger on them from mm -hmm. the watchful eye because they have yeah. a developmental disability, but an age equivalent peer is doing the same thing two rows down and it's like oh yeah that's a blind spot we're fine with that right so it's unfortunate that it has to come to that right. sometimes but yeah. people can make any space a private space if mm -hmm. you know how mm -hmm. and then if you don't know how then you're unfortunately going to have to follow some pretty rigid rules yeah. mm -hmm. so yeah. that you know yeah. you're not getting in trouble anywhere and then kind of just quickly jumping off a little bit on the behaviors and stuff like I know the issue of consent is a conversation that you and like, we've had at DSRF and how to approach that subject with our population. Like, do you, what are your thoughts on on the issue of consent and how we can? So, people need to know that their their body, their choice. Mm -hmm. And a lot of parents are like, no, you mm -hmm. know, I make a lot of decisions to keep my child safe, and it comes from the most loving, wonderful intentions. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Um, I know our listeners come from all over the place, so it might be different from where you come from. But in BC, there's the Adult Guardianship Act, and it, it refers to a lot of things, but it also refers to your sexual autonomy. And a person can give consent, like legally, mm -hmm. like morally, ethically, in every way, unless that is taken away from them. And there are really very few... T um, examples of when that is taken away from somebody mm -hmm. so everybody who's listening can assume that their teen and adult with down syndrome is considered a consenting adult and they can make their decisions about their own body and who they're going to do what with and where and all of these things and 
that can go wrong, obviously, in so many ways. Many people make mistakes, but if you're, you know, also making mistakes without any education, Mm -hmm. no guidance, right? No guidance, and you're being watched by everybody, Mm -hmm. it sets a, it's a recipe for disaster for somebody being like, well, I'd rather just not let you, yeah, ever get into that situation again. No dating, yeah, know this, know that when. You know, if that is something that they want to do, it should be more, instead of restricting them from things, giving them even more education, if yep. that's what you're worried about. Yeah. Because you really don't want them to be, I mean, you don't want anybody to go through heartbreak and course, harassment yeah. or assault or any, you know, there's just so many ways it can go terribly wrong. Mm-hmm. But legally, they have the autonomy to do that and they should and you should be feel confident that they're going to explore these things safely Mm -hmm. but they're not going to do it safely without by ignoring it and pretending that they're just children forever who don't even want to do this ever Mm -hmm. great very well okay so we're gonna take a quick break um, and then we'll be back with andrea lee and our topic on sexual health in people with down syndrome Show the world you love someone with Down syndrome. DSRF Down syndrome swag shop is stocked with shirts, baby clothes, bags, and more. Whether you're looking for World Down syndrome day products, DSRF brand merchandise, or general Down syndrome items, we have what you're looking for. Love live on 21st chromosome and Down syndrome Craig lives at dsrf.org slash shop. My name is Andrew. I am the photographer. Photos are my interest because I love scenes. It makes me feel very close to people. My photo cards are on my IT shop through Andrew's eyes at dsrf.org slash Andrew. Don't forget to watch my video through Andrew's eyes on YouTube. All right, we're back here with the Learn On podcast. It's Marla and my co-host, Hina Mahmoud, the OT at the DSRF. And we're talking today with Andrea Lee, who is a certified sexual health educator in BC, Canada, and she also works here at the DSRF. And today we're talking about all things sexuality. Um, So, Andrew, I was wondering if you could explain if and what the differences would be in the sexual and reproductive health between people with Down syndrome and the larger population. Okay. I'll talk about reproductive health first. Sure. Um, Because with that, a lot of people are like, oh, well, they're infertile, so whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And because of so many reasons, hormonal reasons, especially with testosterone, with sperm development, with a bunch of other stuff that is not my forte, not super great with biology, mm-hmm. there is a significantly lower rate of fertility mm-hmm. with people, with all folks with Down syndrome, especially with like men. Mm-hmm. But there are still cases of people becoming pregnant and people impregnating others, mm-hmm. you know. So I can't, you can't say that they're infertile. Yeah. So I'm thinking. But, so that means sexual health education still is important. They still should know about um, birth control Mm -hmm. and all of these things. And then more than that, so for things like, for sexual health things like STIs, Mm -hmm. oh yeah, they're still going to get all the STIs and spread all the STIs as somebody else. And a lot of the research is kind of hard because they'll put all intellectual and developmental disabilities together Mm -hmm. for a lot of the things that I've been reading and learning about. And so, and a lot of the things with Down syndrome is either old or it's limited. Mm -hmm. So I can't really say, give any really super detailed statistics about this, but generally the rate of STIs is going up for people with intellectual disabilities and the rate of um, self-identifying as being in a relationship or as dating is going down. Mm -hmm. 
So something's going wrong here.、Mm-hmm. You know, if you're having less, what you would identify as a relationship or a dating or a consensual experience, but more folks are getting STIs,、mm-hmm. and I don't know because this was just a general for everybody with IDD. Intellectual and developmental disabilities. I don't know what that would be with Down syndrome,、hmm. but it's something that you have to consider.、Mm-hmm. That is this an education thing that nobody's teaching them how to use barrier methods of、yeah. contraceptives?、Mm-hmm. Is this it's really hard for them to do it,、yeah. and so they're doing it improperly、mm-hmm. because that's going to happen with everybody,、sure. or is it something else? And it's probably a mix of. All of it, you、right. know. And I wonder too, you know, if something doesn't feel right, do our teen and adult students know that they should tell somebody? Exactly. If they have pain or something. Yes. And then, so are things getting missed that way? And also because adults may assume, like their caregivers, etc., may assume that nothing's happening,、mm-hmm. so they don't know to check or ask or bring that to a doctor either.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's super good point. If you don't have the language of consent or disclosure,、yeah. you yeah. can't even tell people、yeah. what you've been doing, what could have been happening,、mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and a lot of the times too, if nobody's been talking to you about your bodies and you what to look for, what to look for,、mm-hmm. if、True. you don't know. That your when something touches your genitals, it's supposed to feel good, yeah, and yeah. then it feels painful, and you don't know why, or you don't put、mm-hmm. it together that like, oh, my body sometimes feels pain, and sometimes、mm-hmm. it doesn't, or burning, or whatever it、mm-hmm. is, then you can't get the help you need.、Mm-hmm. And we do know too. That pain localization for people with Down syndrome is difficult,、mm-hmm. and it has to do with the neuroreceptors and all kinds of biologically based things. So. Even if there's pain, you know, let's say somebody's broken their leg, that doesn't always come across. Yeah, you know, very concrete, very clear source of pain. And for something that's a little bit more diffuse、yeah. and hard to identify anyway, especially if you've never been taught about it, you're certainly not going to be able to explain it to other people. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you don't know the difference between your vulva and your vagina, how are you going to tell anybody what's going on if it's something you know、mm-hmm. yeah. around there?、Mm-hmm. Hmm. Oh yeah. So though for in that way, there's a whole bunch of sexual health issues、mm-hmm. that would be different,、mm-hmm. right? And communicating around them. I'm an SLP. I have to say, it. communicating <laughs> around them too is also different and probably more direct and probably a little bit more uncomfortable for the supporters because you、yeah. feel like you have to do a little bit more in, inquisitive questioning, which might make you uncomfortable. But、mm-hmm. there it is. Um, so that brings us to the next area, which is that this is a really tough area that many families are not really sure how to address it, regardless of their age of their child or who their child is. So, do you have any recommendations of number one, the types of conversations that are important, and number two, who should be having those conversations? Okay, I'll do who first because、okay. I feel like that's a shorter answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>、um, I feel like a lot of people be- can be having. These conversations,、mm-hmm. any trusted adult,、uh, and it's too bad. So when I did my training, I spoke and met with a lot of different sexual health educators, and I would always ask because of you know personal bias, like how many people with Down syndrome have you taught? And these are people who teach in schools, who teach at private organizations, who teach wherever. You know, they've taught hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people across BC. And I think the answer was zero.、Mm. That they've taught zero people with Down syndrome. Oh no, one person had, but that's because she only teaches people with intellectual and developmental、mm. disabilities.、Mm-hmm. But that means, you know, all, sexual health and relationship decision making, all of that stuff, is a big part of the BC curriculum. And that means all of our students with Down syndrome are being pulled from whenever. This is being done with、mm-hmm. a professional, with a sexual health professional, and I've had parents tell me, "Oh, I pulled them out because they won't get anything out of it," or then they get more time to do this. They'll get some one-on-one time to do this, and that's more important. And maybe they won't get a lot out of it, you know. 
Yeah. But they all get something out of it, and it's a good starting off point for conversations you can have at home, mm-hmm. and and also it just legally are supposed to be learning this at schools, mm-hmm. and it acknowledges that they are having physical development at mm-hmm. the same rate as their peers, yeah. right? Because yeah. Pulling them out doesn't mean it's not happening. Right, and how isolating is that yeah. for you? Ah, you don't need to know this. That's not important to you. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. oh, but that's a whole different inclusion story. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so, you know, you can have certified sexual health educators doing that. If you're not comfortable with your child doing it with their entire class at school, or maybe not every year you're not comfortable with that, there are educators who do this one-on-one in small groups with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I think, you know, who are they learning the most from? You learn the most from your guardians, from your parents, right? Mm -hmm. It has to start at home, especially all the basics, your body parts, public and private, um, types of relationship. What's the difference between a friend and a romantic partner and a paid helper and a stranger, Mm -hmm. which is so extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, any trusted adult should be having this conversation because you're going to be having it, I think, literally hundreds of times in d- over a lifetime, mm-hmm. all the time, a little bit, often. Would yeah. you recommend like a specific age? Because I know like body part identification can be something that can be introduced when they're much younger. Yeah. But like, what are your thoughts on? So when? for things about like bodies and. Uh, consent around your body and autonomy with your body mm-hmm. basically starts at birth mm-hmm. you know in changing it <laughs> it's like sounds silly but it does you're changing a diaper a lot of parents are like nickname things but you could just call it what it is you yeah. can just call it you know oh my goodness i've found out so many weird names that people are calling <laughs> their body parts so many food names i'm oh. like why is that better oh, oh dear. than calling it a penis or a vulva you know? yeah. <laughs> so like that kind of stuff that counts that's what i'm counting in these sexual health conversations identifying your body parts that starts at birth if you were going to use a nickname just use the real name if it ever comes up mm-hmm. you know you don't have to go out of your way to be like ah Look at your anus, look at your vulva, look at your penis. But if it comes up, you know, do it. You can model consent and touch and types of touch within your family, within the people in your lives mm-hmm. from birth as well. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, you're saying bye to grandma. Do you want to give them a hug or do you want to give them a kiss? Do you want to just say goodbye? Mm. And leaving that up to them, not being like, go kiss them. You know, a lot of... Our folks with Down syndrome are super affectionate, but you have to teach them that the other person has to want it too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And you have to want it too. It's an equal yes. thing. Yes. So sure. those types of conversations, they start as soon as you're talking yeah. to somebody and then you're modeling it as well. Mm-hmm. Everything else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. With this kind of stuff, I think it's lifelong. It's from mm-hmm. birth until mm-hmm. death. Something's going to come up. Yeah. And everybody's going to be needing guidance. And there's so many, so many conversations to be had. So for the types of conversations, um, I feel like the big ones can be separated into two t- different categories. Safety always comes up. Mm-hmm. It's abuse prevention, mm-hmm. which is, you know, it, it has to come up because people with down syndrome people with disabilities all disabilities are targeted for abuse at a higher rate than people who do not have disabilities and it's disgusting and it's sad but it's a reality that you have to prepare for Mm -hmm. so there's things about safety um and just as a quick tip for that um there was oh it's a bc educator meg hickling so she was a nurse and she What's the story? She was doing sex ed in prisons or something like that. Mm -hmm. And while she was there and had this captive audience, she started asking people who were imprisoned for like violent crimes and sexual crimes, how did you pick your victims? And a lot of them told her 
that you look for, you look for vulnerable people and one of the indicators is they don't know the names of their body parts because mm-hmm. if someone doesn't mm-hmm. know the names of their body parts they probably either have no trusted adults or like the kinds of trusted adults that they wouldn't have this conversation with mm. so if i found someone who called it whatever or had no idea what their body parts were i could do things with them and i knew no one is going to no. follow up yeah, yeah there's no and so you know if you're mm. having the safety conversation that's the very first one you have is the proper names of your mm-hmm. body parts mm-hmm. just because then if a predator or somebody unsafe is targeting your child because mm-hmm. you know they have down syndrome and they can see it just them being a you know they'll come up with the sneakiest way to try and work that into a conversation mm-hmm. online wherever mm-hmm. you know grooming is a whole huge topic of conversation but just in the very 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 basics as soon as you show that you know the correct names mm-hmm. of your body parts you're a little safer they will be like oh I'll go for the next person or yeah. whatever they're going to go for the easy the target and there's lots yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you know, safety conversations are huge. If you know that they're sexually active at all or exploring, you have to talk about safety in that regard too. SDIs and pregnancy and things like that too. So, you know, of course have those conversations early and often. But I think um, what gets kind of ignored is conversations about like pleasure and autonomy. Like Mm -hmm. no one wants to admit that people do things with their bodies with their genitals because it feels good Mm -hmm. and that they have that right to do it and if you don't talk about it for one if it feels bad because they're being coerced or exploited or taken advantage of Mm -hmm. they don't know the difference so you need to talk about that too but even from a self-advocacy standpoint you should tell them that this is really empowering there are things you can do to yourself and with others that like you'll really like Mm -hmm. and let's explore that safely you know there are types of relationships beyond your family and your friends that could be really cool you could have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a partner maybe you're going to get married you know don't ignore stuff like that let people know let people with down syndrome know You can get married now. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, that's such, a, that's such, a, that's such a good point because it's such a common theme amongst our adults. When I have conversations with them, like, oh, like if you ask an adult, at least my experience, like, what is, you know, what do you see yourself as in five years or whatever? Yeah. Like some sort of future oriented conversation, and they're like, I want a job, and I want to get married. Yeah. And so like, why shouldn't they dream of those things? As right? Well, right. Like, just because they have an intellectual disability does not mean that they have this. They don't have those same dreams. Like. Right? Especially like, with the marriage thing. Yeah, celebrate yeah. Yeah. All, all the different kinds of relationships you want. And yeah. not everybody has a romantic partner or wants one. Yeah. And cool, that's cool too. Yeah. And I think you got to be realistic about, you know, that you're a person with Down syndrome and what that means mm-hmm. in society. Like, well, one, maybe you won't have children. Mm-hmm. Like, maybe you can't. And that's just a reality of your body. So, mm-hmm. you know. You don't want someone who that's their dream right and it yeah. ca- can't it ever be. happen for lots of reasons it might not happen too yeah. you know you don't want to get stuck in a fantasy just to have it yes. cr- from crashing down on you later mm-hmm. but then also i feel like um with down syndrome oh i'm gonna bring this up S- dr susan fawcett and i just did this pilot program called raise me up mm-hmm. and it was a self-esteem and relationship program for people with down syndrome and it was the time of my life it was just so great but a lot of it was uh when you're talking about relationships romantic relationships people with down syndrome get a lot of messages from society media families everything about what a desirable person looks like ah you're tall dark and handsome Mm -hmm. i like someone who's super smart and you're someone who is short in stature who has an intellectual disability Mm -hmm. and everybody's telling you that you're undesirable because of that but you're not you know there are way there are so many things that are way more important than that Mm -hmm. that and there's people who will desire you and want to be 
affectionate with you and spend time with you and get to know you. Yeah. And so I think you really have to celebrate Down syndrome too. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not necessarily a sexual health conversation, but it kind of is in the, if you put it in terms of relationships and romantic relationships and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like it, I don't know, I've just heard so many sad stories over the years from my students, from their families of oh I'm ugly mm -hmm. I don't want to date I can't date I'm not going to get married and you hear them on the other side too where they're mm -hmm. like I know I look good <laughs> everybody wants me <laughs> you know like you get yeah. in, in any population you're gonna get both sides of the confidence yeah. spectrum but I think you need to have conversations about Down syndrome and what that is going to mean for you mm -hmm. you are not unmarriable you are probably not going to marry a celebrity which is what they all <laughs> yeah. strive for but it's got to be realistic you've got to talk about like the difference between a paid helper and your friend i know yeah. that's a really tricky one too yeah. but <laughs> and i've seen so many times where a student will have a really intense crush on a typically developing peer and it doesn't go anywhere mm -hmm. and they end up really dismayed as mm -hmm. any teenager would who has an unrequited crush yeah but the difference is that then they may conclude that they can't date anybody yeah and, and that's not the case but you don't want to ever tell somebody like oh you can only date people with down syndrome right yeah but there is a level of realisticness that needs to happen in order for our students to feel empowered and confident mm -hmm. and like they deserve to have a relationship if yeah, they want just like one. anyone else yeah, yeah. yeah exactly it, mm -hmm. a lot of it is just like anybody else but at a different scale mm -hmm. you know there should be a power balance in any relationship mm -hmm. whether that's intellectual or financial or whatever there's mm -hmm. so many ways people can take advantage of another person and so for somebody with down syndrome you don't like exactly like you said you can't be like you can only date somebody with an intellectual disability but you should be dating a peer with an equal power power balance to mm -hmm. you whether mm -hmm. that's with age or you know a lot of other things yeah oh my gosh mm -hmm. oh I, I thought of something and then i was like well how was i going to say that <laughs> It like we're, I don't know. All, talking about this was reminding me that a lot of these conversations will feel really awkward and mm -hmm. really difficult, but they are kind of the same that everybody else is having, just not as often. <laughs> so, for example, I was telling people about how I was teaching about the difference between paid helpers and your friends, mm -hmm. and how paid helpers are paid to help you and be nice to you and to hang out with you and maybe they'll be your friend but in that scenario your therapist is not your friend mm -hmm. and you can still trust them and like them and have so much fun with them but when you're seeing them in this scenario they aren't your friends and someone's yeah. like oh that's so mean like don't tear down their hopes and dreams and I'm like everybody gets this conversation when <laughs> <laughs> you know, in your late teens, early 20s, didn't everybody have a friend or wish they had a friend that said, don't hit on the bartender, he's paid to be nice to you, he's not actually interested in you? It's the same thing, yeah. different scenario, you know? Yeah, like, like, it's, <laughs> yeah, you know, my, my dreams of the hot bartender dashed, <laughs> but yeah. your, your dreams of dating your teacher dashed, but it's realistic and it's honest and it's something you need it's to concrete, know. Concrete, yeah. yeah and where a typically developing teen might pick up on that from a peer, mm -hmm. right? Or they'll mm -hmm. watch their friend hit on the bartender or whatever <laughs> yeah. and see it go south. Our students don't necessarily have pick the advantage of having a bunch of peers to watch how exactly. this all plays out. Mm -hmm. And they benefit a lot from the more direct teaching. Indirect is really not. No. Yeah, not the way to go. We're not going for nuance here. We're going for checklists. We're going yeah, for, yeah. can I date yes. this person? Are yeah. they paid to be with me? Are they in my family? Then it's no. Are they in a relationship already? Are they whatever? Yeah. yeah. Are they a celebrity? <laughs> well, it's a no. Yeah. yeah. We had Come to do. across a lot of that here. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. do. Right? A lot of celebrity crushes. Oh, yeah. when we were doing circles, um, 
And you were, sorry to interrupt, but can you just quickly talk a little bit, because you referred to circles of intimacy throughout. Can you just tell us a little bit yeah, about it quickly? It's a, and then, yeah, it's a program done by, what is it, Stanfield? Mm -hmm. And it, so the circles are, you're the middle circle, and this is, and as you go outer and outer in the circles, it talks about people's relationships to you. So your most intimate circle, the closest to you is your family. And then it re reaches out to your friends, to paid helpers and acquaintances, community helpers, and to strangers. And what are the different roles of all of these relationships you have with these people? What are the different types of touch that you can have with these people? Can you hug a stranger? No, yeah. super unexpected. Can you hug a friend? Yeah. Can you hug a, fa hug a family member? Sure. Can you wave at a stranger? Sure. I feel like that stranger relationship was one of the hardest ones. Acquaintances and stranger, mm. where it's like, yeah, let's date your friends. You know, somebody that you know a lot about, you have the same interests in that you can hang out with. And then it's just like, oh, well, Sean Mendes has all of those except for one. I know everything about him. Mm. We are both Canadian. We have so much in common, but he's still a stranger. Mm -hmm. you, you're just a and fan. He doesn't know I exist. Right? Yeah. He doesn't know you <laughs> exist. And if he did, he's not single. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> You know, and like yeah. same with acquaintances. Does that hunky person in your school know you exist or are they not even an acquaintance? Are they a stranger? Are yeah. they a classmate or do they hang out with you outside? Have you had conversations where both ways showed you liked each other and were interested in getting to know each other, not just one way? And mm -hmm. that's so hard when a lot of your conversations are one way because it's hard for you yeah. to keep the conversation going. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a little sad to be like, they're not dateable. They are not. But mm -hmm. it's, you just have to. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing, too, that I've seen where, with everybody, but a lot of the times with people with intellectual disabilities, where it's, you know, cute, like, ooh, do you like this person? Are you going to date them? They would make a good boyfriend, girlfriend, partner. Yeah. But if you don't see the nuance that that's a joke, it's not very nice. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to yeah, date them. them up for, yeah. Like a huge disappointment. Mm -hmm. Like it's not that cute. Mm -hmm. When yeah, they were part. like, they would make a good partner. They yeah. are very handsome. Oh, but it's somebody who is married. Yeah. And, and 55 or yeah. whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's tricky. I think it is hard because it feels mean but it's kind. Exactly, it's, exactly. You're trying to set expectations around what's going to help your student or friend or child be confident mm -hmm. and be successful in their relationships in the future. Mm -hmm. Like something you had brought up, I think when we were on the break, um, how you've seen people in schools, nobody talks about you know the power balance or mm -hmm. that you should only date your friends or things like that. that there's rules to dating mm -hmm. that you're not gonna you might not figure it out on your own especially if you have down syndrome and instead you just have a crush on everybody ask them out yeah. and every single person you ask out rejects you mm -hmm. and how terrible that feels yeah. and of course you're gonna feel like well i have down syndrome no one wants to date me but if somebody explicitly told you maybe even wrote it out for you because visuals work so well mm -hmm. you know someone with a boyfriend girlfriend wife spouse partner isn't going to be interested in you yeah, that's just the reality. Like, it's not mean. It's yeah. saving you from a lot of rejection and terrible things. And it's so hard to undo it once they yes. get into that phase. Because I'm thinking of, of, of some of our teenagers where they're so into that crush phase, where it's really hard to bring them back out of it. Yeah. So if we can kind of start earlier mm -hmm. and be use that direct teaching, like Marlo was referring mm -hmm. to, then hopefully we won't get to that point. Because it is very hard very to get them to get because for them it's almost a reality now yes. and it's like a mission that they're on like yeah. I have to get this person this person's going to be my boyfriend or girlfriend and it's yeah it's really hard to go back for it yeah and I think that's one of the things that should be coming up early too but it's hard to remember that because yeah. when you talk to everybody else you can joke about it and you can imply and you yeah. can be like ooh who are you going to date mm -hmm. who yeah. are you going to marry <laughs> yeah. when it's realistically the whole world is not yes <laughs> available available yeah like, and like we said before, the interests of somebody aren't going to give you that clue like, oh, it's mm -hmm. time for that conversation now mm -hmm. because we're still exactly. watching cartoons and playing the Wiggles or whatever, but it's it's time. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 
when you notice that other kids in your student's class starting to go through puberty, go then. Go yeah. Then. yeah. <laughs> go now. Yes. It's the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, let's talk about resources. So there are many resources of varying quality and varying levels of usefulness for this sort of group of people. What do you like? What do you not like? Okay, so I talked about circles of intimacy. Yeah. Find that. Solid. Find someone who will teach it. I Okay, there are so many things. And I feel like today's talk was really geared towards family. So I'm going to go th for those kinds yeah. of resources. The number one holy grail person is Terry Cohenhoven. She is a sexual health educator. I think she's American. Mm -hmm. Her daughter has Down syndrome. I think mm -hmm. she's a young woman now. Mm -hmm. And all of her books, everywhere she's ever spoken, anything she's ever done is just golden. Um, I just this summer read Teaching Children with Down Syndrome about their bodies, boundaries, and sexuality. Mm -hmm. That was her book. So I feel like a lot of things I said today are probably straight from that book, and I don't realize it because I just loved it so much. <laughs> okay. It's so practical. There's activities. There's scripts you follow. Awesome. You know, you can just go to the chapter that's relevant to you right now. So, so, so great. She's also written The Girl's Guide to Growing Up and The yeah. Boy's Guide to Growing Up, which are wonderful. They're basically social stories about puberty. Mm -hmm. They have pictures of what it looks like to change your pad. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to show them a thousand times, you have this book so they can look at it hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. And it's so great. Um, she, you know, when they're a little bit older, she has the book Boyfriends and Girlfriends. It's really great as well, too. I just think Terry Cohenhoven, we'll put her in the notes or something. Yeah, we'll definitely her her name's like, pretty, to pretty hard yeah. to spell. Yeah, yeah. No problem. <laughs> I had to listen to a podcast with her on it to make sure I was saying it correctly. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would just say for folks with Down syndrome and the families that love them and care for them, go for her first yeah mm -hmm. and that boyfriend and girlfriends book is so great yeah it talks about one-way crushes yeah. it talks about who you can date who you shouldn't date what even counts as a date mm -hmm. you know you because that happens sometimes too yeah. our students will be like oh i went on a date and actually they were in the same class yeah the you're on a field trip yeah. or something yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know yeah just it's very clear and she's so great. respectful yes of the parent and of the person with down syndrome you know she understands but it's a struggle for everybody. These are really tough things to watch your child go through. These are tough things for your family to go through. Yeah. And I think just she's the best. Um, also, for maybe some online things, uh, in Burnaby, actually, it's an organization called Real Talk. Mm. And they do a lot of things relating to sexual health and relationships for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And they have this really great online library of videos with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities talking about everything, every topic you can think of. They've probably got a video about it, which is really wonderful to watch yeah. somebody that you yeah. relate to talking about things you're relating to and going through right now. So yeah. really like real talk. Is it R-E-A-L, like regular real or R-E-A-L? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can put it in the notes. Perfect. Real-talk.org. Yep. Um, and we can also maybe put in a couple of like uh, social story templates of public versus private and puberty social stories. Yeah. So something that you can just access to if you if, like you need to. And Terry's got it down. Really, yeah. check out her book. She's got so many things so that you don't have to. Even do it. Do the thing. Invent it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just take but it is overwhelming. Like you yeah. said, it's a yeah. really broad topic and it's very, very important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to mess it up. And there's a lot of ways that it can get messed up. So you yes. need some guidance. Yeah. yeah. And sure. it's hard. Like her book's yeah. a textbook. Yeah. <laughs> like it took me all summer to read it. Yeah. There's a lot going on. Oh, then you can have me. I will help you. Yeah, perfect. I was just going to say, yeah. Are you okay <laughs> with people banging down your yeah. door? Oh, I was just going to say, are you okay with us sharing your email oh, yeah. address and parents and families can contact Andrea you? Andrea so we'll at dsrf.org. I would love to point you in the right direction. I am right. currently developing more programs. I, I 
briefly mentioned the one that Susan and I did. Mm -hmm. We want that to be a series or a year-long program that focuses on dating and friendships and relationships and, you know, sexual decision-making, whatever that means for Mm -hmm. your person. We learned so much from the folks that were in our pilot group about what they want to learn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it. What did they... Oh, my God. It was the best. (laughs) So... I honestly just asked, what do you want to learn? Mm-hmm. And I feel like you don't get asked that a lot in general, but mm-hmm. especially somebody with Down syndrome. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and someone shut their hand up and they had this list going. Girls, interest, talking, saying hi, dating, boyfriends, marriage, sex, babies, how? And I was like, <laughs> got it. Got it. <laughs> Basically <laughs> done. Yeah. everything, Pretty much everything ever. But it's also really sweet what they want to know, too. <laughs> it's almost like a timeline thing. They just want to know what the timeline is going to look like. Can you please tell me yeah. from yeah. my very first yeah. interest in the in another person yeah. to the end goal yeah. of raising a family yeah. every single step in between. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they wanted to know, like, mm-hmm. what is attraction and how do I become attractive and mm. what does that mean to be attractive? Mm. How do I say hi to somebody I don't know? How do I make a stranger into an acquaintance, an acquaintance into a friend, a friend into a romantic partner. (laughs) And on our evaluation forms, it was like, what did you learn about sex? I'm like, we didn't talk about sex in this particular program. What did you want to learn? More sex. And I was like, all righty, (laughs) okay. And a lot of them too, they're talking about how sex is something that people do with their partners. I'm like, but what is sex? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, they actually don't know that it's it's just a thing yeah Mm -hmm. like a a concept of romantic something you know yeah that they wanted to learn i mean they weren't asking for lessons on privacy and public versus private and expected and unexpected behavior but then when you got to it and what they were doing in public isn't being taken super well Mm -hmm. that is what they want to learn they do want to know how am i going to be accepted in this society and seen as a person like a sexual being whatever that means to you you know Mm -hmm. they wanted to know everything and i wanted to teach them everything (laughs) and one day i will (laughs) it's a long process yeah awesome i had that's all my questions well we want to thank you Yes. Big, big, big thank you because this is going to be so helpful and so informative for everyone that's listening parents, educators, Mm -hmm. siblings, just. That's pretty fun. Yeah, it was, it was very, very great. So thank you so much for joining us. I feel like there's. And hopefully we'll have you on. And another episode, we can kind of tackle another. I know, that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, oh, there's at least a dozen topics. Oh, for sure. At least 30 topics that I didn't even get to talk about. Perfect. We're good to go then. That people want to know about or things that we touched on so little. It's awesome. hard. Yeah, it is hard. And it's important. Yeah, great. Thank well, you so thank much, you, Andrea. Andrea. Yay. Okay. Thank you. It was fun. Next week on The Lowdown, a Down Syndrome podcast. You know, we, we've been talking about the sensory experiences of food and mm-hmm. how um, important that is for being successful with eating. And um, we just want to remember that there are ways to bring uh, sensory experiences to a child's mouth that don't necessarily yeah. involve food or the risk of choking or the mm-hmm. risk of yeah. you know developing those kind of fear associations with food. So yeah. sort of lower stress. Lower things. stress, exactly. Yes. Yes. A little bit of oral stimulation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. totally. Yeah, yeah. and that can look you know like a variety of things. Often you know there's a little bit of like mouth massage. There's mm-hmm. a variety of like you know stimulating kind of teething tools or teething toys that you know we can kind of apply gradually. Even mm-hmm. just a parent's finger mm-hmm. um, in the mouth daily. You know can really help to kind of get that system that sensory system online and and kind of getting going so mm-hmm. yeah. you know there's a lot that you can do even if your baby isn't quite ready to um, you know jump all the way into food food or you right know, you know milk milk or whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. yeah the lowdown the down syndrome podcast is a production of down stone search foundation or more at dsof.org and join the conversation at dsof canada on twitter facebook and instagram and lowdown is hosted by marla Foden and hannah mahmoud and it's produced by glenn hughes the lowdown theme music and just do was written and recorded by rick scott <laughs>